Hi everyone, here I am ready to take you through my deeper experience of spending some time with Kashmir. And I want to say again that this is my second piece of music which I've listened to from Led Zeppelin. And the first one of course was Stairway to Heaven quite early on in my journey and those of you who have watched it you know what I'm talking about if you haven't watched it you should check the link out here because you might be interested to compare these two experiences anyway so here I am and I I kind of got into this piece of music I did it took me a little a few listens but after my first listen which you have seen if you haven't it's it's right here you should Watch that. The next thing I did was sit down and listen to the song Unbroken all the way through several times in a row, just letting it sink in and seeing how my ideas and feelings and perceptions of it would, would develop. Of course the name Kashmir makes me think of the Himalayan northern Indian region, which I've never been there, but I understand it's very beautiful. And so, of course, I had this idea in mind as I began spending time listening to the music. I was thinking of, you know, the Himalayan mountain peaks and what I know about that beautiful part of the world. And I started by trying to relate the, the riff and the musical elements textures to the idea of that region. But interestingly, very interesting to me at least, about halfway through my second non-stop listen to the music, I suddenly had this, this recollection being pushed into my mind of a classical harp piece of music. Um, it's a work for solo harp, very angular, sparse, brilliant, vivid colors in it. Um, it's titled The Santa Fe Suite by William Mathias. He's a Welsh 20th century harp composer. And um, I was intrigued by this, by this connection because the Santa Fe Suite was directly inspired by the composer's visit to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he paints a gorgeous tonal picture of the beautiful desert landscape of that area. I have been through Santa Fe once, a long time ago. I don't remember a whole lot about it, but of course I've been there, I've seen pictures of it, and it's a bit closer than Kashmir in terms of geography for me. Anyway, the more I listened, the more I began to feel instinctively that Kashmir and Santa Fe Suite hold a lot in common, in spite of being two very different pieces and styles of music. And I'm going to inclu include a link to this Santa Fe Suite so that you can check it out yourself, and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts about that. Anyway, after listening a few more times, I went to read about the backstory behind this song, Kashmir, by Led Zeppelin. And big surprise, in spite of its name, Kashmir was inspired by a long drive through the Sahara Desert along the Moroccan coast. And I found it really incredible to think that that element, that desert element, came through strongly enough in the music as to eventually pull me out of thinking of the Himalayas to send me towards Matthias's Santa Fe suite. And, and I was thinking, this is really incredible. Music is really powerful and truly it can transport us to a, a place. Well, it's also true that the lyrics might have helped me a bit in that direction because they contain lines like, my eyes fill with sand as I scan this wasted land or uh, pilot of the storm who leaves no trace, or even the opening lines where it speaks of the sun beating down on my face and stars filling my dreams. But at the same time, the lyrics are also referring to Kashmir. So 
I wouldn't say that those those lines were what sent me there. It was the music. And to me, the music is even more descriptive than the lyrics. I hear in the music a vast landscape. It's a bit barren, jagged, angular, with intensely strong colors. I can picture a brilliant blue sky above, sand and rocks below with all the desert colors, sparse vegetation, powerful bright sun, harsh contrasts, and a seemingly endless vast expanse which also at the same time is very immediate and tangible. Of course, there's more than one way to achieve that musically. But what I'd love to do is show you some of the elements in this music which stand out to me as helping to create this effect. So first of all, the rhythmic structure that we find at the opening. And I thought carefully about whether to talk about the overall song structure first or to dive straight into these rhythmic elements of the intro and verses. And I finally settled on this latter choice because this is the first thing we experience when we start listening to this music. And it is also such an important part of the whole musical experience. I think it's worth putting our focus there first. There are two main features, main elements, in the opening of this music. One is the instrumental riff or motif theme, whatever we choose to call it. And the second one is the drum pattern. Now, let's talk about the instrumental riff first, simply because it's what's in my mind first. Um, it is set in a rhythmic pattern of what musicians would call 6-8, meaning if we're dividing the beats and placing them in groupings, we're going to hear one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we essentially have two groups with three beats in each group. Now, this riff is what the guitar and eventually the strings end up giving. One and two, three, four and five, six. Da da dum, ba da dum, bum, ba da dum, da da dum, bum, ba da dum, da da dum, bum, ba da dum, da da dum, bum. And it's their ascending chromatic line, which I'll show on the harp in a moment. Underneath that, or maybe not underneath, equal to that is the drum pattern, which is set in four. So the drum is going one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And you can imagine easily mathematically six and four don't line up and arrive back at one at the same time. And I want to show you what it is in the music itself. And fortunately in this score, the, they have set it so that the, the two lines are right next to each other, right above each other. So we're not having to spread our eyes too far. Here's what we have in the instrumental riff. We have one and two, three, and then our next place where we have an accent is on beat four, four and five, six. And this is the first big division of the instruments, but I don't want to actually place that division through the drums as well. And the drums lie underneath. So I'm going to make it shorter, but I want to make it very clear that this is a big dividing point. That pattern repeats exactly the same. So all I have to do is count one, two, three, four, five, six, Here's our next big dividing point. One, two, three, four, five, six. And here is our next big dividing point. One, two, three, four, five, six. And our next big dividing point happens to land right on one of these little, um, little bar lines here, which you can see. 
this little black line, it's the same thing as where our dividing point is. And then of course, one, two, three, four, five, six, it goes on. And that pattern continues on and on and on, cycling through. Now, going back to the drums, let's use a different color so that we can see easily. Let's go with blue. And the drums have one, two, three, four, and they arrive exactly on this bar line dividing point because the whole music is set up printed in this four pattern. And you can see that the dividing point is not aligned with the instrumental division. Same thing with the drums here. There it is. Always the drums are dividing on the bar line, just exactly like this. Now you can see that this moment here where I drew that bar line where the instrumental riff arrives just at the bar line is the first time since the beginning of the song that both the drums and the instruments are stacking exactly together in sequence on one together. That is right here. And so it takes this cycle of multiple repetitions of the drum part and multiple repetitions of the instrumental part in order for them to come back together and land at the same moment. Now the other feature of this instrumental riff is not just the rhythm, but the pitches themselves. And what I am calling, you're hearing me say, the chromatic ascent. Chromatic meaning simply that we're stepping up in the smallest increments available to us on traditional instruments, like harp, like piano, like guitar. If you press one fret and go the next fret up on the guitar, if you press one piano key and go to the immediate adjacent black or white key, that's what we call chromatic. So that's what's happening here. And it gives this, it gives this sense of building intensity because it's like we're climbing and climbing and climbing just a little bit more. At the same time, it creates a balance of, of sweet consonants and hard dissonance, which builds as well. So if we're listening to the pitches, because we always have the root, the D, placed as a sort of pedal, as a constant drone underneath everything. So I have this D here. It's going to be constantly heard. I can place it anywhere on the harp. All right, and then above that, you hear ya da dum, da da dum, bum, ba da dum, da da dum, bum, da da dum, da da dum, bum, ba da dum, da da dum, bum, ba da dum. That's the climbing up, ascending. Um, chromatic pattern. Now listen to how it sounds when I place it against the D. This is a sweet sound here. Very pure and open sounding. And then as I step up, the, the upper note steps up. It's not too dissonant, but it's not as pure sounding as the first. And then we move the upper note up again. We hear the anticipation building, and this is the most wonderful, edgy, dissonant moment. I love it. It's crunchy, it's hard, it's a little bit um, harsh sounding. And then finally we come back to this pure sound at the top, which is quite open and... and um, easy for our ears to process. Now another feature before I move away from this is that this cycle which repeats over and over in the music has one other element to it. Remember I said it was in groups of six. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, 
six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Did you notice what happened at the last? As I arrived on one, it was also the beginning of the next sequence because four, five, six was the second part. It's, it's like a place where the music stacks. The beginning and the ending are the exact same moment. So it creates a sort of circular pattern which overlaps and, and the music both resolves and begins again in the same moment, adding this other element of a compelling forward drive where we never come to the end because the end is also the beginning. Now that's what we hear in all the verses and anywhere else that follows the same pattern. So it is one of the primary features of the song, but there are also sections such as the bridge sections where everything returns to the solid four beat pattern and, and doesn't fight against it which the drum is continuously holding. Which means that in spite of all of this stacking of polymeters, which is what we call when we have different groupings stacked above each other, like this, in spite of that, the song ends up feeling very strongly grounded by this square, assertive four beat pattern throughout. And the drum holds that the entire way through. These rhythmic elements create both an incredible sense of stability and, I think, a strong depth of perspective. When we talk about, you know, you think of the vanishing point of a, of a piece of art where what's our, what's, our, what's our perspective depth that we're looking at, whether it's camera or painting or whatever. These rhythmic elements help create that depth. And that is why I think it so easily conjures images of mountain peaks or jagged desert rock formations or vast expanses of sand dunes, while at the same time taking us all the way down to even thinking about the little creatures that live in these enormous landscapes. I kind of mentioned in passing that the drums are not underneath the instrumental part. And the, by the instrumental part, I'm talking about what the guitars and the strings are doing in their musical riff motif. The drums kind of force a very prominent position in the balance. And it's crucial because everything else is pushing against it and they have to be very assertive and dominant in order to give this strength to the piece. At the same time, the instruments carry equal weight, not only because of their powerful rhythmic element, which is very catchy, da da dum, da da dum, bum, but also their melodic and harmonic qualities, which I just showed you on the harp, the, the dissonance, the rising element of the chromatic line, and so forth. And then of course there's the vocal line. Now, in my first listen, I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to the vocal line because it isn't, it's not hidden, it's not buried, but at the same time, it is not center stage. It's more like one other element to the music and it kind of sounds like it's a bit removed from everything else. But I want to give some attention to it right now because it also contributes to the music. Notice that as the song is being sung, pretty much nothing changes in the melody. It's a very simple melodic line which happens over and over again without a lot of change in the notes themselves. But what does change is the dynamic range. It, it's very dynamic and um, has a lot of shape to it emotionally. 
there's a sort of raw and gritty tone which shows up in the voice in different parts of it. It's colorful in that way. And it doesn't rely on changing notes, changing phrases to create that effect. It's all about the timbre, the tonal quality that gives it the interest that holds us, holds us in it. Another thing about it is that it travels quite freely separate from the heavy stability of the instruments, both the drums and the other instruments involved. It's not encumbered by the instrumental music. I wouldn't say that it's floating above, because it doesn't give the impression of floating above, but it does feel like a different entity. And this entity is carrying and expressing the weight of its own experience rather than being something which is part of the instrumental portion of the music. And as I said, to me it feels somewhat removed, meaning I perceive it as, as if an observer or a transient presence is in this landscape. Maybe it's us. Maybe it's somebody we're seeing out there. But there also it helps to create this multi-dimensional depth within the musical fabric. Again, as the music progresses, we don't really have variation in the form of notes, chords, rhythms, etc. Yes, there are different sections of the music, but each one is pretty much identical to the preceding sections which, with which it it pairs itself. So instead we have small adjustments or additions in the orchestration, in the instrumental and vocal um, coloring and, and tonal expression. And the best way to kind of map these is to think about the overall formal shape of the music, which if you remember at the beginning of this I was saying, I was kind of going back and forth which one to to dive into first. So this music is really quite long, but not because there is a lot of musical development. It's because there is a lot of repetition of various sections. Of course, we have the intro, which is just the instrumental first few seconds of the song. And then the verse enters, which is instrumentally identical to the intro. The only difference being the voice is now present. That's our first added element. Now, unlike a lot of songs, there isn't a vocal chorus. There is something that sort of features as a chorus, but it's instrumental only. And you can hear that when the chorus comes, it adds horns and kind of more guitar. So those are more things adding in. Then we come to the second verse, which instrumentally and melodically in the voice is exactly the same as the first. But there is a difference. There are now strings added, a sort of counter line being added, which is yet another element to keep us progressing. And then of course the chorus comes again, same as the first chorus, but with the strings included. Now there is one part of the music which only happens once, and that is what we could call the first bridge. And this one is, is kind of more open, sparse, percussive, kind of a little bit rhythmically, um, it might even feel off balance or weird just because it's, it's, it's kind of set up differently gives a good variety. The drums feature very strongly here and even the other instruments, they, they feature in a very percussive rhythmic manner. And then we go back to the chorus, which is exactly the same as before. Then there's the second bridge. And this time, um, this bridge adds um, some synthesized or what I read and understand to be Mellotron playing high strings, while a real orchestra 
has strings playing an answering line. So again, we have this dynamic growth and at the same time we've got those horns helping to add accents at the ends of some of those lines. Then again, there's a verse. Exactly the same as before, but we've got some low horns added in. And then the last verses and choruses are also the same as before, except the final chorus adds strings again, and bridge number two, which is the final ending part, um, and I'm calling it bridge number two simply because it is the same as bridge number two, which came before. But this time it's functioning as an ending part of the music, and it fades out. But even as it's fading out, we hear the mellotron strings, horns, and then the orchestral strings entering, and of course some extra drumming stuff happening. So even as it's fading out, musical stuff is coming in. And so that is what carries us through the piece. So you can see that the way in which this song is made to be so compelling is not by musical development, but rather by a tightly woven fabric of rhythmic and melodic features from which are extruded sonic development or variety or growth. And I guess I'd choose the word growth because that's the impression I get. The song grows, it builds, it continues all the way through, even as it's fading out at the end. Now, after all of this exploration, I went back and listened to several live versions of the song as well, and some orchestral transcriptions. Not surprisingly, there are some really great ones out there because this piece is compelling enough to make somebody want to adapt it and use it. I guess my favorite classical orchestral version that I have found so far is the performance done by the Johannesburg Youth Orchestra. It's vibrant, full of energy, and I, th I think that it really captures the spirit of the song incredibly well, and there is a link here for that if you're interested in testing it out. Now, of course, with a piece of music like this, you can understand why, even in a classical style orchestra, the rock drum set is imperative. Because no matter how traditional we want to go with the instrumentation, by traditional I'm meaning um, classical traditional instruments, acoustic instruments, it's that juxtaposition of the drum part against the instrumental riff that is the core, the very center of the life of the piece. And so you'll hear that drum, rock drum set, even in this classical orchestra, but it works incredibly well. One of the things that stood out to me is how in the portion of the song where in my first listen, you heard me comment that the descending chords, bum, 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 made me think of Rachmaninoff. But now, set in the sound of this orchestra, that section, as well as certain other parts of the music too, I really felt like it was strongly akin to Gershwin. Which is not really surprising, being that he was an American composer who easily crossed between and seamlessly fused both the classical and the jazz styles in his music. I also enjoyed the 1994 performance of Page and Plant with an Egyptian Moroccan orchestra for their live album called No Quarter, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant Unleaded. But what I found most fascinating about it is that in this version, rather than highlight and expand on the desert scene which first inspired the song and which this song really pushed me towards, they pushed it to evoke their perception of Kashmir, incorporating all kinds of Indian musical elements, and it turns out it works really well. So this song can actually go both ways, and maybe there are other ways it could go too, but it can go either towards painting the desert 
or towards the image of Indian Kashmir. Now, I want to just share a little bit about my experience with Led Zeppelin so far. I've only listened to two of their pieces, Stairway to Heaven and Kashmir. I'm sure I have a lot more to discover of their music, but between these two, which I understand are pretty outstanding, iconic songs in their whole repertoire, both of them are very different. Stairway, on one hand, has longer melodic figures and more traditional harmonic design. It's, it's very, well, if you watch my, my experience of it, then you will see that it's built on very f traditional folk style chord progressions and melodies and things like that. Whereas Kashmir utilizes shorter and what we could call more punchy motivic figures, which provide both the rhythm and the consonance dissonance elements of the music that gives it that power and that drive. However, both of them make outstanding use of repetitive compositional techniques, even though they do it in different ways. Altogether, my feeling about Kashmir is that it is a vivid piece of music. I feel like it's beautiful in its intensity. It's both incredibly passionate and powerfully contained, restrained, tightly bound together by its musical design in which its rhythmic features play a massive role. Now, you might wonder, do I like it? Would I listen to it? And I have to say that this one really caught me in a way that I, I will find myself going back and listening to it. It has enough, it has enough um, meat to it that I feel like I can enjoy it multiple times without getting bored or tired of it. At the same time, it's not just heavy intensity, but it's also beautiful in its own way. So again, this was the community vote piece, winning piece for this month. And I thank you all for choosing it for me. I have been intending to return to Led Zeppelin's music for quite some time, and I'm happy to have gone back and listened to another one of their pieces. I'm sure I will do more in the future. But um, until then, or until next time, enjoy and I will see you soon.